So welcome everyone, and thank you for coming to uh, the presentation today, Advanced Searching for Scientific Articles. My name is Brendan Fitzgibbon. I'm a librarian here at Polytechnic. And as I just uh, mentioned, today's presentation is going to be recorded. So if ever you wouldn't like your face to appear on the recording, that's completely fine. Uh, just feel free to keep your camera off. And if you have any questions, you can ask them in the chat, or you can also um, open your microphone and ask them verbally. And I'll make sure to take a few pauses throughout the presentation today so you can ask your questions. So the outline today and what we're going to be talking about is first, we're going to be talking about the organization of information. More specifically, we're going to be talking about the different kinds of resources that you have access to here at Polytechnic that are a little bit unique and that you can't access through um, a search engine like Google Scholar or Google. We're also going to talk about how to build complex queries, and we're going to use um, a search strategy called the classical method, which is pretty basic and it's um, very interesting. And you're able to um, build very um, exhaustive search strategies for your research projects. And then right at the end of today's presentation, I'm also going to talk about how you can search by citations. So that's when you already have a article that you know about. And you want to see what um, sources and what articles that source has cited and how that article has kind of been used since it was published and how it's been cited throughout time. These are just two different ways of uh, of ways you can find for you can find documents. You can also find a document from an existing bibliography as well as searching by author, although we aren't going to cover these two, two kinds of search methods um, in today's workshop, just search by citation and the classical search method. For everyone who just showed up, uh, I'll just mention again that uh, the presentation today is going to be recorded. So if you ever don't want your uh, face to appear on the recording, that's fine. Just keep your camera off and um, you can ask your questions either in the chat or by opening up your microphone. Uh, and if ever, I'm gonna be doing a little bit of switching between um, my browser and the presentation today. So if ever I'm doing a presentation, uh, if ever I'm speaking and you're still on the PowerPoint when I'm supposed to be showing you the library website or a database, just let me know. That happens sometimes where um, when I'm sharing my screen, it's not able to make the transfer between PowerPoint and my web browser super easily. So let's begin by talking about the organization of information. So what information sources does the library provide? So to begin, hopefully everyone here has already configured the library's proxy. The proxy is what's going to allow you to access the majority of the library's resources when you're not located on campus and you're not connected to Polytechnic's Wi-Fi network. So when you're at home, if you've configured the proxy, it's going to communicate with different databases and different resources that you have access to through the library, that you're a Polytechnic student and that you're allowed to have access to them. And you'll be able to access them when you're at home. The, v, uh, the proxy is not the same thing as the VPN, but it's much simpler to configure than the VPN. The way you can do that is go to the library website. Under the services tab, there's the option off-campus access. Just click on that, and then you'll see various guides and videos on how to configure the proxy depending on what your operating system is. So please do that after today's presentation if you haven't already. And the proxy is very important because, like I mentioned, it's what's going to allow you to access the majority of the library's resources. And a lot of these resources aren't accessible through um, the automatically indexed web or the part of the internet that you can find through a um, search engine like Google. You need to access these resources by going through the library website. And it's part of the internet that we call the invisible web. Um, and it's not indexed on search engines because either it's going to be hidden behind a paywall, you need to have a subscription to it, or for various other reasons, you can't find it through Google. You need to go through the library website. When you pay tuition fees, part of those tuition fees uh, come to the library, which becomes our operating budget. And we use that operating budget in part to purchase subscriptions to databases and other resources um, that you can use to find scientific literature for your projects. Um, we have databases and there's also SOFIA, which effectively works as the 
catalog for uh, the Polytechnic Library. We're not going to be talking about Sophia today, but we are going to be talking about in depth about different databases, which is um, one of the main ty types of resources that we offer to you at the library. And we have various kinds of databases here at the library. We have databases for geospatial data, statistical data, research data, et cetera, et cetera. For the purposes of this workshop, we're mainly going to be sticking with bibliographic databases. Bibliographic databases will compile bibliographic information on scientific articles, conference papers, books, theses, et cetera, et cetera. And what I mean by bibliographic data or bibliographic information, that's things like the title of the article, the authors, their institutional affiliation, what year it was published in what journal or what conference proceeding, things like that. And when we talk about bibliographic databases, there are three main variants. There are databases that give you access only to the references, which would be the bibliographic data. There are databases which will offer you access to the bibliographic data, as well as the full text of the article or the document that you want to see. So we call these full text databases. And there's also hybrid databases, which is a mix of both. So some articles or some documents you'll be able to have the full text to, and some of them you're only going to have access to the bibliographic information. But these databases usually look pretty similar. So for example, here I've got a screen capture from the database Compendix. As we can see, I've got all of my bibliographic data. So I've got the title, the journal, the abstract, um, the digital object identifier, the publisher, everything like that. If you've configured the proxy for most uh, reference only databases, you should see a button like this, which says document or document, and then Polytechnics colors right next to it. If you click on this button, you're going to be sent to the library website and we'll see if we have in our, if we, if we have access to this article through one of our other databases or in our catalog. Okay, so you, at, you with most full tech, uh, well, excuse me, with most reference only databases, there are still ways for you to access these texts or at least to see if we have access to a copy of them at Polytechnic. With bibliographic databases, you can find the document, so they're used to locate research that might be pertinent to you, to analyze its pertinence, since we'll be able to get a better idea through the abstract and the title if this is a document that might be be pertinent for our research interests, and we can cite the document because we have all the bibliographic information. When you click on that document button, uh, it'll send you to either a page which will immediately let you download the PDF, or you can follow a link to the publisher's website. If we only have a paper copy of the article, it'll send you to so Sophia, which is our catalog, and you can see more information on how to get access to the paper format at the library. And if we don't have access to it, you can always do an interlibrary loan, in which case we'll see if we can locate a copy of this text at another library somewhere and through one way or another, give you access to it. And then we also have, whoops, excuse me. And then we also have um, full text databases, which are gonna look like this. They're very similar to a reference only database, obviously, with the one main difference being that um, you can download the PDF directly in the database. You don't need to go through the library catalog to see if we have access to a copy of it. And a few notes about bibliographic databases. The first thing is that there's a lot of overlap between them. So you're going to find out that um, articles will be indexed in multiple different databases because no bibliographic database is exhaustive of all of the research that's ever been published. Even a search engine like Google Scholar doesn't have references on every scientific article and every conference paper that's ever been published. It doesn't exist. Rather, what these databases try to do is they try to index all of the research within a certain domain. So for example, PubMed tries to be exhaust, they try to index every article that's published in the domain of medicine, nursing science, biomed, things like that. 
Uh, Compendix will try and index every single article that's uh, published in the domain of engineering, et cetera, et cetera. And so because of this, it's usually a good idea, and we recommend highly, that you search in multiple databases in order to make sure that you're finding all or most of the research that exists in a topic or on a topic. Because the third thing you need to keep in mind also is that some articles will not be included in any database for one reason or not. And all you can, you, you can never be 100% certain that you have found every single piece of information on your research topic. You can at least be relatively certain that you found all of the most relevant information and all of the most important research on your topic, okay? So articles will be indexed in multiple databases. No index is exhaustive and some articles are not included in every database. And the main differences between full text databases and reference only databases, like I kind of mentioned in the previous slide, is that the objective of a reference only database is to cover an entire area of knowledge. Whereas for a full text database, it's to provide access to a publisher's publications. And usually the articles and the documents you'll find on these kinds of databases, they're all going to be coming from one publisher which we can tell through the titles of the databases usually. IEEE Explore indexes research published by IEEE. Springer Link is for Springer, Wiley Online Libraries for Wiley, et cetera, et cetera. Full text data, uh, excuse me, reference only databases um, compile bibliographic information from various publishers. So they tend to be a bit uh, much bigger in the number, in the raw number of articles that they index. For reference only databases, you'll get the bibliographic references and the bibliographic data. You can get the full text in full text databases. The contents are not retrievable via Google for reference only databases. This is because you need to have a subscription in order to access these databases at all. That's how the companies who make these databases make their money through subscriptions to the databases. Whereas with full text databases, the contents are often retrievable via Google because the way that these publishers make their money is by um, users purchasing to have access to articles or to journals, individual journals. And so you can access these databases and you can uh, find these contents using Google because they are automatically indexed. Here at the library, we have various different guides. Um, we have um, subject guides and we have other guides for other subjects of interest. I'm gonna take a quick um, journey over to the library website just to show you them very quickly. So when you're here at the library website, if you go under guides and tutorials, guides by subject, you'll be able to see all of our guides and they're divided by the different uh, departments here at Polytechnic. If you click on one, you'll get the contact information for the librarian, your, uh, the librarian responsible for your department. And if you look up here, you'll also have uh, access to various resources, specialized resources that uh, myself and my colleagues have chosen that we think are going to be useful for you when you're doing research in your domain. So different specialized dictionaries and encyclopedias, different books which might be of interest to you, journal and conference articles. And we have different databases that we think are specialized for, that are specialized for research within your domain. In almost every guide or every guide, I believe, the first one is always going to be Compendix because it's the most um, expansive database within the domain of engineering. And it tends to cover all domains of engineering. Um, so it's very, um, extensive and a very useful resource. But then we also have other ones which we can recommend, and that'll depend on what um, library guide you're looking at. Back to the presentation now. Do I have any questions so far relating to databases or the library resources or anything I've gone over so far? If not, feel free to post your questions in the chat anytime and I'll get around to them when I can. Because now we're gonna talk about the classical search method and this is um, the big part of the presentation today. 
So the classical search method is a search by topic using a complex search strategy. It's often used to find all articles published on a specific topic. And the reason why we call it the classical search method is because in library school, it's the method that's taught to all librarians. And if you went to any university across Canada right now, and you went to a workshop on how to search for scientific articles, the librarian will almost definitely be telling their students about the classical search method. It's um, a very basic um, strategy for finding scientific articles, but it's a very powerful and methodical one as well. And the purpose of the classical method is that you'll create searches that are exhaustive and which won't exclude any pertinent research for your information needs. And generally, there, there's seven steps to the classical search method. <clears throat> the first is defining your information need, which might seem a little um, simplistic, a little bit basic, but it is really important because it's going to define everything that comes next. Um, so you really need to make sure that you have a clear information need. So what do I mean by information need? So an information need is what it is that you're looking for, and you should be able to describe this information need in a single sentence, and importantly, a basic sentence. So not ones with plenty of commas, ands, things like that. It should be relatively basic. Your information need is not necessarily going to be the same thing as the title of your research subject, and you're probably going to have multiple information needs at every single stage of your research. And these information needs are going to change over time. And for each one, you'll need to build a new um, complex search query because they're very specific. So your information need is going to determine the next steps of your process. So you should have a better understanding of what they look like and how you can make one. And to give you a better idea of what an information need looks like, I've got some examples here of uh, some statements and how we could possibly reformulate these statements into an information need. So the first one is the student is looking for information on the causes of, of urinary system dysfunctions and paraplegics and the ways used to overcome them, specifically using the implantation of a neurostimulator. This is too complex. Um, I can tell already that this statement has at least two information needs. The first one being the causes of urinary system dysfunctions and paraplegics and how the second one would be something like how paraplegics can overcome or how you can use a neurostimulator to overcome um, urinary system dysfunctions. So the way I would simplify this or reformulate it into a better information need for at least one of the information needs of the student would be the design of a neurostimulator to overcome the dysfunctions of the, of ur of the urinary system in paraplegics. The second statement, e-commerce, that is way too general. That's not an information need, it's just a word. So you're going to have to um, specify exactly what you're, you need in relation to e-commerce, such as the use of web services for the implementation of, electro of an electronic commerce system. The goal of building um, a complex search query is to be as exhaustive as possible but at the same time, you don't want 4 million results. You need to, it needs to be a number of results that is reason, you can reasonably assume that you can get through them and look at them all. And the third explanation, or the third statement, digital modeling of thermal effects on aluminum alloys. Well, in fact, that's a pretty good information need. I don't think I need to change anything for that. It's already pretty basic and it's only looking for one piece of information. I hope that's clear. And if it's not, just let me know. So for the purposes of uh, today's workshop, we're going to assume that my information topic or my uh, the topic of my research is different, way, different numerical simulations for ice accretion on wind turbine blades. And now I need to define my information need. And maybe I decide that, you know what? wind turbine blades, that's a little bit too specific. I think I'd also like to see how um, engineers who work on um, other projects that involve airfoils, how they solve the problem of ice accretion on these airfoils. 
and just um for for uh, term, per, terminological reasons, an airfoil is any structure with a curved surface that's used as the basic form of an air turbine or a wind turbine, as well as wings, propellers, things like that. So rather, I'll reformulate my information need to be that I'm looking for information on numerical simulations of ice accretion on airfoils. This way, I can see how um, aerospace engineers, engineers who work on aircraft, or on helicopters um, and in other domains, how they uh, tackle this question of um, numerical simulations for ice accretion, rather than it just being about wind turbine blades. And it's up to you to decide if you want to be more general or if um, really the only thing you're looking for is numerical simulation of ice accretion on wind turbine blades rather than being more vague. It's up to you to decide. Only you can really know your information need. Once we have that, we're going to divide this information need into different concepts. And what I mean by that is we're going to dissect it a little bit into um, various different concepts that we can describe usually in just one or two words. And there'll be multiple concepts. It's hard to explain how to divide into concepts. You kind of just know it when you see it, or at least you should. But some questions you can ask yourself are, what are the main aspects that need to be minimally covered by articles that you're searching for? What do you want articles on this topic to contain? What is the object, organization, person, group being studied? Is it limited or can you be more vague? And is there a specific technique or methodology or research method um, being used that you want um, to identify or target specifically? Or is that too restrictive, which it might be? Up to you to decide as well. And once you start to build your search strategy, you'll be able to realize pretty quick if you've chosen concepts that are too restrictive or too broad. So to go back to the um, examples I had earlier, for the first statement, um, I can say that my concepts would probably be neurostimulators, dysfunctions of the urinary system, and then I would find keywords for all of the different diseases and dysfunctions that affect a urinary system, and paraplegics. And those are my three concepts. For the second one, it's going to be web services and, e and an e-commerce system. And for the third one, it's much more uh, obvious. It's going to be digital modeling, thermal effects, and aluminum alloys. For the second statement here, implementation could also be a potential concept. You would just kind of have to see how um, your search strategy um, is interpreted by a database when you look for just web services and e-commerce systems first, and then decide if you need to maybe incorporate a third concept or not. Again, with this process, it's very iterative, and it's a lot of going back and forth and figuring out what's working, what's not working. But I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. So the third step of the classical search method um, is developing a conceptual plan. So once I have my information need, I've chosen what my broad concepts are. I can build a conceptual plan to help give a little bit of structure to a little bit of structure before I build a basic search strategy and to list all of the keywords I want to use to describe each of these concepts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a table, a basic table. Each column is going to represent a different concept. Each row in each individual column will represent a different keyword that I can use to describe that concept there. And again, the purpose of all of this is just to give a bit of structure so it's easy to see all of the keywords and all of my concepts all in one place. And it's organized in a logical, coherent manner. So if I go back to my topic on the numerical simulation of ice secretion on airfoils, I'll have three topics, airfoils or airfoil, ice secretion, and numerical simulation. Off the top of my head, I've chosen some keywords I can use to describe these things. So wings, airplanes, 
blades, wind turbine, things like that. And then what I'm going to eventually do is I'm also going to incorporate Boolean operators because databases, at least most databases, understand Boolean operators. So between each concept, I'm going to add the Boolean operator and, and between each keyword within the same concept, I'll add the Boolean operator or. So I'm going to be communicating eventually with the database that I'm looking for any article that mentions at least one of the keywords from the first concept and one of the keywords from the second and one of the keywords from the third. So if I was looking for articles and we take a look at the bottom right here with this Venn diagram I've made, I'm looking for all of the articles that fall right in the middle of these three concepts. And I'm gonna show you exactly what this is gonna look like in a few slides. So these are just keywords that I've thought of off the top of my head, but I need to go much deeper uh, than this as well. And I need to be much more exhaustive with uh, the keywords and the vocabulary I'm using in my search strategy. There's different ways I can do this. I can look through dictionaries like Termium, which was published and updated by the Canadian government, or the Constitutionnel Terminologique, which is updated by the Bureau de la Langue Française du Québec, um, in order to find more uh, vocabulary used to describe airfoils, numerical simulations, etc. I can use specialized encyclopedias, specialized handbooks, specialized dictionaries, research articles I already know about to see what kind of vocabulary they use to describe these concepts, things like that. And we really highly recommend dictionaries like Termium Plus because um, they are really useful to help get you um, up to date a little bit with um, the vocabulary used in your research domain. So for example, here I am at Termium Plus. To be able to access Termium Plus, you need to have a, uh, you, you need to have configured the proxy for Polytechnic, because this is a resource that you have access to using the library's website. If I look for airfoils, or airfoil rather, make it a little bit bigger for you. If I look for airfoil, I can choose what domain I'm looking in, and I can click search. And then what Termium Plus is going to give me is it's going to give me uh, various records. Um, or, or excuse me, it's going to give me the definition of airfoil, yes, but then also other variations of um, airfoil in different contexts. So for example, lifting surface. And if I look down here, I can see that lifting surface is the term standardized by the International Standards Organization. So that would be really important to keep in mind. Aerofoil, which is... Um, Airfoil and aerofoil are both terms officially approved by the International Civil uh, Aviation Organization, the ICAO. So these would be really important words also to include in my search strategy. Up here, I've got what subjects or what domain or what field these terms are used in, because sometimes certain words can have different meanings depending on the domain you're, uh, you're working in. And if I scroll down a little bit, I can see the definition for airfoil as it relates to other research domains as well. And I can look through all these files to make sure I've got all of um, all of the, the keywords I need from Termium Plus. And I should use multiple resources as well to make sure that I've got everything I need, all of the keywords. Um, so the other thing we can do um, is include other synonyms that are more general or more precise according to your information need. You can include, or don't forget to include variant spellings because many words are written slightly different in the um, American English versus the British English context. So keep that in mind because they might be written differently in scientific articles sometimes. Don't forget to include uh, abbreviations, acronyms, things like that if you need to. And you can also add truncations. And I'll talk about truncations in two slides. So once I've uh, taken all of these keywords and I've looked through all these resources, I'll have a conceptual plan that looks like this. And we can already see that it's much more extensive, much more uh, in-depth 
than my first conceptual plan. So I've included all of these different keywords for each one, and I've really been as exhaustive as I can regarding the vocabulary. One last thing we can do to our conceptual plan before we translate this into an actual search strategy is we can include truncations. A truncation is something we call a search operator. Um, these are different symbols which um, have different meanings, which will communicate a certain thing to, the data, to a database. And uh, these symbols are common for most databases. Always verify that um, it's the same symbol for a truncation or for an exact expression or something like that. But they're understood by most databases. And a truncation is represented by the asterisk symbol right here. And what it's going to communicate to a database is that we're searching for all words that have a common root, but where the, uh, the ending is variable. So if we're looking at a model, for example, with the asterisk at the end, I'm going to be looking for, I'm going, I'm communicating to the database that I'm looking for model, yes, but also models, modeling, et cetera, et cetera. So in this way, even if I have a very large conceptual plan like this, I can use truncations to cut down the, the size of my conceptual plan a little bit because with truncations, I can search for four or five different keywords while only actually having one keyword in my search strategy or my conceptual plan. A couple of things you need to keep in mind. Um, don't use a truncation too early in the word. If you look for hydro with the asterisk, you're going to be searching for plenty of different words that have nothing to do with each other because hydro is a pretty common root for words. So be careful about that. Keep in mind that there are often variations in the way a word is written in the singular form versus the plural form. So trajectory, if you put it after the Y instead of after the um, second R, you're going to miss out on trajectories. And um, make sure you've you've thought of all the possible variations of a word, like for probable lit, you're not going to be getting probabilistic, for example. So look at each word and make sure there's nothing you're really missing um, when you're putting those truncations someplace, because this is a super common mistake students make. And you can miss out on a lot of really useful literature just because you've put the truncation at the wrong spot. The other common mistake that uh, students make often at this stage are redundant keywords. If I'm looking at, if I'm searching for ice or ice formation or ice accumulation, this is redundant. It's redundant because any article that mentions ice accumulation or ice formation will be found just by searching for the word ice, right? Because ice is the, the umbrella term, it's the more broader term. Ice formation, ice accumulation is more specific. So we just need to make the choice, do we wanna be broad or do we wanna be more specific? If we wanna be more broad and we want any article that mentions ice, we'll pick ice. But if we really only want information about the formation of ice or the accumulation of ice, just pick ice formation or ice accumulation, but don't do all three at the same time. So keep that in mind as well. Do I have any questions yet? I know I'm moving very quickly. There's a, a lot to talk about, but if anyone has any questions, just uh, post them in the chat at any point. Um, okay, so now then, I've uh, incorporated my truncations. So I've got the plural versions of words. Uh, I've got um, I've I've put the truncation for uh, other words so that I've got all the variations of either numerics or numerical and simulate as well. And you'll notice that in the middle here, I haven't included truncations for keywords related to ice. And this is because um, most databases won't allow you to put a truncation on a word that's less than four letters. And the reason for this is because there's all different, it's, it's, it's too broad, it's gonna give you too many results because there's all different kinds of words that can begin with three letters and then have various other 
endings. So never put a truncation on a word that's less than four letters long, at least. So I've put all of those variations one after each other um, in my conceptual plan. Ice, icy, iced, icing. Okay, so then that's our conceptual plan. Now, all we need to do once we picked all this vocabulary is just translate it into a basic strategy. And for most databases, it's going to look something like this. So, in between each keyword, like I mentioned, I put the OR Boolean operator. It's always in capitals, it's always preceded by a space, it's always followed by a space. Surrounding each concept, I've put parentheses here and here, so that the database understands that all of these keywords are part of one concept. And then between concepts, I put the AND Boolean operator. Again, all in capitals, preceded by a space, followed by a space. And then once I've done that, it's um, time to pick a database that I want to use. So like I said, you can use the one of the library guides uh, or the library guide for your department in order to choose what database you want to use. Um, and you'll need to make minor modifications to your search strategy based on what database you're using because they all have different limitations. Some databases will only let you use 10 truncations per search query. Some uh, will um, only let you have a certain number of concepts, things like that. So always take a look at what the limitations are for the database that you want to use and make little changes to your search strategy in order to take that uh, into consideration. And like I also mentioned, today we're mainly going to be staying in one database, but you should always consort, uh, con uh, excuse me, you should always consult more than just one database. <clears throat> excuse me. Okay, we're going to go once again on the library website so that I can show you how to um, begin using a database like Compendix or Inspec. Um, both of these two databases are available on the same platform, Engineering Village, but they have a slightly different, um, they, they specialize in slightly different areas. Compendix is um, the larger one. It, uh, the oldest articles um, were published in 1884 and it gets updated every single week. Um, now it has about 21 million references from 4,000 journals and about 6.9 million conference articles. So about 27 million, 28 million indexed items total on all different uh, domains of engineering. InSpec is a little bit more specialized. It's a little bit smaller, but it's specialized more in the areas of com uh, computer engineering, software engineering, um, electrical engineering, physics, things like that. So if you're doing your research in a domain related to one of those, maybe InSpec is better for you. But in general, Compendix is always a good place to start. So we're going to go back to the library website and take a look at the interface for that a little bit. OK, so um, excuse me. We're going to go back to the library website. And to see a list of all the databases that you have access to as Polytechnic students, you can go to Search Tools, go to A to Z Databases. And you'll have a list of all of the possible databases that um, we have a subscription to here at Polytechnic. For Compendix, obviously, we're going to pick on C. We're going to go down to Compendix. We'll click on that. If we've configured the proxy and it's our first time accessing a resource, there'll be a pop-up that will ask you for your um, uh, P-matricule, your uh, P-matricule, and your um, password. That's the same password you use to access your email. Once we're here, we're going to be on the uh, homepage for um, Engineering Village, which is the platform. Um, Engineering Village is updated and, and um, provided by Elsevier, which is a scientific editor. On Engineering Village, like I mentioned, we can access multiple databases 
Here at Polytechnic, we have Compendix, Inspec, and Novel. Novel is for uh, handbooks and book chapters, so it's not really useful for us for this class today, so I'm going to forget about it, which leaves Compendix and Inspec. Engineering Village offers you the chance to search in both at the same time. You need to resist the urge to do so. Um, Engineering Village doesn't handle uh, duplicates very well, and there's a lot of overlap between these two databases. If you search in both, it's going to cause a lot of unforeseen problems. So although you should search in multiple databases, you should search in multiple databases one by one, okay? So I'm going to unselect inspec so that I'm only searching in Compendix. Um, the other thing we need to know about is by default, um, Engineering Village is going to suggest Quick Search. Quick search is good if you're looking for a couple of articles, if you're just looking for a specific article, if you just have a really want to launch a really quick um, search strategy or something like that. But if we've gone to all the time to develop this complex search query, what we should rather do is use the expert search search function. And I'm going to access that by going to the search tab and clicking on expert. Using expert, um, you're going to have access to a lot of the higher functions of um, Engineering Village and Compendix. And it's really worth your time to use this rather than Quick Search, especially if you've already devoted all this time to building a complex search strategy. The other things we're going to do immediately, so we've chosen Compendix. We can pick a date range. So. If, for example, I know that any article published before 2012 is not going to interest me because my research domain has developed so quickly that anything that's more than 10 years old is not useful, I can state that I've only want articles that are published between 2012 and 2023 to show up in my results. This is already going to remove a lot of non-pertinent articles from my search results just by the, the factor that they were published before 2012. So you can pick a date range. This is going to depend on what your research topic is and what domain you're doing research in. If you're in uh, computer engineering, it could be that um, articles published, published before 2020 are no longer pertinent for your research. If you're in mining engineering, it might be that there are articles from the 1970s that are useful for your research. It depends on your topic. It depends on your domain. Up to you to decide. The other thing we're going to do immediately is when we choose sort by, we're going to pick a uh, date rather than by relevance. And I'll explain why in a few minutes. Uh, and the last thing we're going to do is under auto stemming, make sure that it's turned off. If auto stemming isn't turned off, um, what Engineering Village and Compendix are going to do is they're going to interpret your search strategy in a different way. So they're going to make their own modifications to it. Whereas, again, if we've done all of this work to develop a search strategy, include truncations and operators and everything like that, I want Compendix to read it as it's written and not make any other changes. So auto stemming should be turned off. The other thing we recommend that you do um, if you're using Compendix is to create an account. Over here on the top right, we've got my initials BF. There I am, Brendan Fitzgibbon. And it's usually here that you'll be able to create an account. Use your Polytechnic email, create it. It's very quick and very simple. If you don't create an account, you can still use Engineering Village, but you'll get two new functionalities if you do create an account, and they're both very useful. The first one is when we search for articles, the articles are going to, uh, the keywords that I used, they're going to appear highlighted in the titles of the articles. 
If I don't have an account, they're not going to be highlighted. And it's going to be a lot more difficult to see in what context my keywords have been used. So that's one functionality you get by creating an account is the, the keywords are highlighted, which is really useful when we're um, modifying our strategy and optimizing our strategy. So that's the first thing. The other thing up here is we can keep track of our search history. So I can keep track of all of the search strategies I've launched in Compendix or in Spec. And I can come back to it in case I ever close my browser. It's not going to be lost. And what's more is that if I've got a really good search strategy, I can save the search so that it will always be saved in my results. Um, and I can also create an alert. So anytime a new article has been um, indexed in Compendix or in Spec that conforms to my search strategy, I'm going to get an email that tells me that um, this new article has just been indexed. So if I want to stay up to date on um, what's going on in my research domain, and I've created this research strategy, it's a good way to keep up to date with what's going on. Or if ever I want to be notified when a researcher I really like has published a new article, that's another way for me to keep up to date with what they're doing. So please do that. Um, I've gone a little bit ahead of myself. Um, so what I've done uh, is I've launched our search strategy, but just the first concept so far. So these are all of my keywords related to airfoils. Down here, I can see that I'm searching in only one database, Compendix, for 2012 to 2023, and that my results are sorted by date. And I've got 400,000 results which makes sense because I've got keywords related to airfoils, yes, but also airplanes. So it's gonna be a ton of results. But you're going to see that the more that I add and operators or the more concepts that I add, very quickly, the number of results I have are going to decrease. Just by adding the second concept, ice and, um, or ice accretion and airfoils, now I've only got 7,700 results. And by adding the third concept, I'm going to end up with about 4,412 results. So this is these are all of uh, my keywords that, that I've chosen. And in theory, and I, I put this in quotation marks, in theory, all of these articles will discuss numerical simulations of ice accretion on airfoils. Obviously, I know this isn't the case. Um, search strategies are going to undergo various different versions before you're able to build a search strategy that is really pertinent and has excluded all the non-pertinent articles from your um, results. Because I know for a fact that out of these 4,000 articles, there's probably only going to be a couple hundred that I use for my research project. And there's only going to maybe be a few thousand that have anything to do with what I'm doing research of on. So I need to find a way to exclude these articles that are not pertinent. So the first thing you do after you've launched your first version of your research strategy is you'll need to go through the articles see what's working in your search strategy, see what isn't working, and then make changes. What we recommend you do is that you um, look through the first 100 articles that appear in your search strategy. So look through them, click on the title, read through the abstract, and again, the abstract will also be highlighted. See in what context your keywords are being used. If you see that um, oftentimes the same keywords are being used in the wrong context and it's giving you a lot of noise, what I mean by noise are articles that are not pertinent to you. So if these words are giving you a lot of noise, find a way to modify them or to remove them so that they're no longer in your search strategy or that you're removing all of these non-pertinent articles. And you should look through the first hundred of these articles and keep track of how many are actually pertinent to what you are looking for and how many are not pertinent at all. 
if you find that the majority of these articles, these first hundred articles, are pertinent for you, congrats. That's a good sign. You still need to make changes, obviously, because you can't look through 4,400 articles very easily. You don't need 4,400 articles. But it's a good sign that your strategy seems to be working because it's giving you mostly pertinent results. If you find that um, a majority of these results are not pertinent, that might be a clue that you need to make significant changes either to the concepts and maybe choose a different concept, add another concept or something like that. Or you might need to add or remove keywords in your search strategy in order to remove these non-pertinent references. And this is why we recommend, or well, this is why you should sort your results by date rather than by pertinence when you're looking at these first hundred results. And the reason is if we sort, sort by pertinence, Compendix will show the articles that have the highest frequency of keywords in them first. So you're gonna look through the first hundred articles and you'll say, wow, you know, a lot of these articles are really pertinent to what I'm looking for. I don't need to make any changes to the search strategy. I, all of, all 4,400 articles must be, will mostly be pertinent to what I'm doing research on. But when we sort by relevance, it's a bit like Google because Google will also sort your uh, results by relevance when you launch a certain, uh, a simple question on Google. And just like with Google, when we look at the second, the third, the fourth page of results, we see that the quality of our search results begins to plummet very quickly. And even if the first couple of links on our Google results is exactly what we're looking for, after that, it's um, many of those links will not be pertinent at all to what we want. So when we sort by date, it's a much more um, objective view of our search results rather than if we sort by relevancy. So always do that and do the per, uh, like this little pertinence assessment where you look at the first hundred articles to give you a better idea of some broad changes you can make to your basic search strategy to remove some of the obviously non-pertinent articles from your results. I'm going to head back to my PowerPoint now. Um, excuse me. So that's one thing we can do is, is the relevancy assessment. Let me make sure I didn't forget anything here, but I think we're good. Um, so that's the relevancy assessment where you look through the first hundred results. And the other thing that's important to note that I forgot to mention is uh, numbers are not the only, are not the most important thing. It's better that you have a search strategy that gives you um, 1,000 articles uh, at a 50% relevancy rate rather than um, a search strategy that gives you 100 articles at a 90% relevancy rate. Because with the first strategy, you have 500 relevant articles. With the second one, you only have 90. So you're missing out on a lot of pertinent research to you. So keep that in mind when you're looking through your search results as well, that sometimes going very big and then cutting off the um, excess or the non-pertinent articles is much better rather than try building a very limited search strategy that only gives you a couple hundred results, but which excludes a lot of pertinent stuff. The other thing you can do or another little um, uh, tool you can use to see if your search strategy is working or not is you can identify or you can target known articles within your search results. So if you already know a couple of articles that are highly pertinent to what you're doing research on, you can make sure that they're one of those 4,400 articles and that they're there. This is going to tell you two things. One, if it's there and it's pertinent to you, that probably means that other pertinent articles are also going to be in these results, which is good. The other thing is that if it isn't one of those 4,400 results, that is a very clear sign that there might, that there is something significant, there, there's a significant error in your search strategy because it should be appearing. So read again that article or the abstract, see what vocabulary they're using um, to describe that topic, and then make the modifications to your search strategy so that this article is going to appear. 
My one caveat to that is that make sure first that the article is actually indexed in that database. Otherwise, of course, it isn't going to show up in your results um, because it isn't indexed and you won't be able to find it there. So that's the only thing you need to uh, make sure of. I've made this mistake before uh, where I've tried to locate an article for 10, 15 minutes before realizing it's not indexed in Web of Science or Compendix. So um, just be aware of that. And if it does happen to you, no problem, it happens to all of us as well. The other thing we can do is we can also search for specific authors in our results. So in the example I've got uh, here on screen is uh, I've searched for the author Vil Alpando, who is a professor here at Polytechnic, who does um, their research on this topic. And amongst my results, I've got two articles by Vil Alpando, which is good. And I search for a specific author or article by tacking on to the end of my search strategy, the and operator, and then the author in parentheses or the title of the article in parentheses. If ever I know that uh, Mr. Villalpando, he has 10 articles on the subject and I've only got two records in my results, again, that's maybe a, a signal that something's not working with your search strategy. So just go look at those articles you know about again and, and see if there's any uh, keywords you might have forgotten about that you should incorporate into your search strategy. Because that's an important thing to keep in mind when you're going through uh, your articles and you're doing your relevance assessment is what keywords have I maybe forgotten about, but now I'm realizing I've forgotten by reading these abstracts. Maybe when I'm going through, um, Maybe when I'm going through my 4,400 results, I realize, you know what? A lot of articles that do mention airplanes and wings aren't actually pertinent to what I'm looking for. I made a mistake and I do only want articles that describe uh, wind turbines or airfoils, but that don't describe aircraft. If I remove aircraft, I've cut down, uh, I've taken out about 1,800 results, uh, 1,800 articles from my results, which is good, um, just by removing four keywords, airplane, aeroplane, aircraft, and wing. The other thing that I can realize when I'm going through it maybe is that um, I've, maybe I've forgotten other keywords. Like I can see, you know what? Helicopter. Helicopter is a type of aircraft. Uh, it has propellers, it has airfoils. I should include that keyword into my search strategy as, as well. And I should see if I can find any articles that talk about ice accretion or numerical simulations for ice accretion on helicopters. That's another possibility. The more that we add keywords or or operators, the larger, the more results we're going to get because our search strategy is becoming wider. The more and operators or concepts that we add to our search strategy the more our results are going to decrease because there are more constraints that our articles have to uh, abide by in order for them to appear in our results. Um, are there any questions about anything I've mentioned so far? The chat is silent. I hope I'm, I hope you're, um, everyone's able to follow what I'm uh, talking about. I know it's a lot of information. Like I mentioned um, at the beginning of the, um, the presentation. Um, I'm recording this uh, presentation so that we can send you a copy of it at the end uh, so you can look over it again. And we'll also send you a PDF version of the presentation um, so you can uh, have access to all of the links uh, that uh, you require. Um, okay, next step. We have to talk about how we can optimize a search strategy by using database functionalities. This personally is the most fun part of um, creating a complex search query for me because um, you're able to really cut out a lot of non-pertinent articles in a very definitive, very quick and very simple way. So most databases have various functionalities that are common between all of them. And we can use these to cut out articles that we know are not going to be pertinent to us. 
we already talked about one of these functionalities, the time period covered. So like I said, if I know articles before 2012 are impertinent for me, I can just remove them. That's fine. I can also use exact expressions to filter out non-pertinent articles. What's an exact expression? Well, for example, I've got here an article that is appearing in my uh, results, but it's not pertinent to me. It's about um, swell and sea in the emergent. It's about sea swell in the Arctic Ocean. How can I get rid of it? I or why is it showing up in my results? First of all, I can see it's here because it mentions energy and wind, but is two words completely separate in the abstract. And I had wind energy as one of my keywords. So how can I remove references like this, which use my keywords, yes, but in a context that's not at all what I intended? Well, I can use exact expressions. Like the truncation, an exact expression is another search operator. And this one is going to be represented by the quotation marks. And what it's going to communicate to the database is that I'm looking for I, I use it when I have a keyword that is composed of two or more individual words. And what I'm communicating to the database is I'm searching for this keyword exactly as it is written. So I'm looking for wind energy, not the energy of winds, not energies including wind or anything like that. I'm looking for exactly as it is spelt within the quotation marks. Same thing with ice accretion. This is going to reduce the number of uh, results that you have very quickly. And it's also, if you have proper nouns or the name of an org organization or, or something like that, it's it can be a way that you can filter out a lot of non-pertinent articles from your results very quickly. Um, the example I like to use usually is uh, Internet of Things. So it's three words, but obviously I'm not, you, I'm not um, interested in articles that mention things and internet separately. So if I put Internet of Things in quotation marks, I know for a fact that anything that doesn't say Internet of Things but mention the, those two terms will not be pertinent to me and they'll be excluded. The only thing I have to be worried about is um, it is going to be much more restrictive. And for certain words, I, I won't be able to have, um, I, I might exclude certain articles that are gonna be pertinent to me. For example, if a article mentions energy from wind or the accretion of ice, and they have those little connector words sometimes, but that is what I'm looking for, those articles would be excluded. So just um, keep that in mind. Use them, but use them warily sometimes. And make sure um, you're using the, the, the straight quotation marks, like um, these ones here, not the triangular quotation marks used in French, and not the um, diagonal quotation marks you sometimes see um, in other places as well. So be careful when you're copying and pasting that from, uh, let's say, Word into uh, a database. For Compendix and Inspec, also be aware that um, uh, truncations and exact expressions do not mix. If you put the truncation at the end of an exact expression, Compendix is going to think you're looking for wind machine with an asterisk at the end of it, and it's not going to give you any results, obviously. So you need to write every variation of that word individually, one after another and separated by the OR operator, like wind machine or wind machines. So just be careful about that because I see that mistake um, often among students as well. It's understandable. Some databases I think do let you use a truncation with an exact expression, but unfortunately not Compendix or Inspec. One moment. Thank you. Um, so once I've included all of the exact expressions into my search strategy, and I've also included the keyword helicopter, my search strategy is going to look like this. I've got the plural and the singular forms of these words in my first strategy, in my first concept. 
Second concept, they're all individual words, so they don't need any exact expressions. And in the third concept, there's so many different variations of numerical simulation, numerical simulator, numerical simulations, the simulation in a computer, things like that, that I've decided that, you know what, it's better to just include truncations rather than exact expressions and be too limited. And I'll figure out another way to remove um, non-pertinent articles that are showing up in my results because of this third concept. So that's fine. And if I do that and I return once again to Compendix, once I've incorporated all of those um, exact expressions, I'm going to get now um, about 3,600 or about 3,500 results. Excuse me. So I've included the exact expressions, 2012 to 2013, Compendix, and I've cut out um, about uh, what is it, 900 articles that I know are not going to be pertinent to me or are probably not going to be pertinent to me. So that's good. And that's one way we can optimize. There are more things we can do to optimize as well, however. For example, here's another um, article that I have in my results. It's not pertinent to me. So I go in and I look at why it's appearing in my results and I see, you know what? It looks like the only reason why it's in my results is because in the source field of the uh, indexed item, I've got the acronym ICE, ICE. Um, but that is the only reason why it conforms to my search strategy. And clearly it has nothing to do with what I'm uh, doing research on. So how can I exclude articles uh, like this? Well, what I can do is I can target certain fields uh, within the database so that when I, uh, when I launch my search strategy, it's not looking for words like ice and airfoil and other words like that in any section of the indexed item other than the descriptive sections, which in this case is going to be the title, the abstract, and the subjects. I don't know if I explained that very uh, clearly, so let me maybe say that again. I can um, tartan, uh, excuse me, I can target certain field codes so that um, Compendix is only looking for my keywords within these fields, like the title, the abstract, and the subject, which are the descriptive fields of the indexed item. Because I'm not going to be interested in articles that were published in, I don't know, the, the Journal of Aircraft Engineering, unless the, unless the article itself is about um, the numerical simulation uh, sorry, numerical simulation of ice, of ice accretion on airfoils, excuse me. So I'll target just certain field codes. And the way I'll do that, uh, at least for Compendix, is at the end of the search strategy, or at the end of each concept, I'm going to put WN in lowercase, which tells me, which communicates to Compendix that I'm going to be searching for a field code. Then I'm going to put space and I'll put the name of the field code. For title, abstract, subject headings, for Compendix, it's KY. But there exists plenty of different uh, uh, field codes depending on my needs. So for example, I've got um, abstract here. Uh, I've got just the title. If I was trying to identify a specific author, I could do the same thing and then put in author, AU, so that it's only looking in the author field. This would be really good if I have an author whose um, last name is also a noun, um, for example. Um, so that's another way that I can really quickly exclude a lot of articles that I know or I've, I'm reasonably sure are not going to be pertinent to me because the only reason they're showing up in my results is because their keywords happen to appear in um, the fields that are not descriptive of the contents of the article. And when I incorporate these field codes into my search strategy, 
they're going to look like this. So again, the only thing I've changed here is I've put WNKY at the end of each of my concepts. And if I go back one last time to Compendix and I incorporate these uh, field codes, it's going to give me about, um, excuse me, it's gonna give me about 2,900 uh, 67 results. So about 600 results less than last time. And again, the only reason these 600 results were appearing um, is because they happened by chance to have these keywords in non-descriptive uh, field, uh, fields of the article. I hope that all makes sense. And if not, please someone raise your hand or just let me know in the chat. You're all being very quiet, so either I'm on a roll or um, I hope no one feels too uh, intimidated to ask a question in the chat. Okay. Um, oops, excuse me. There's a third operator, which you should know about, um, although we don't recommend you use. It is the not Boolean operator. So you can use this Boolean operator to exclude, ref to exclude references that contain a certain keyword. In the example here, I've got my search strategy. And at the end of that, I tack on not nuclear WNKY. So I'm going to exclude any article that has the word nuclear in it. In theory, and when you first think about this, this will make sense. If you're doing research on let's say uh, clean energy, but not nuclear energy, it would be, it would make sense to exclude articles that mention nuclear. The problem with this is that it's very, very, very easy to exclude articles that are pertinent to what you're doing research on, but happen to mention nuclear because it can use, be used in plenty of different contexts. Um, or it can also remove articles that are doing a comparison. So if you have an article uh, that's um, doing a comparison between solar energy and nuclear energy, that still sounds like it's going to be pertinent to what you're doing research on, but it's going to be excluded just because it's doing a comparison with nuclear energy. So you can use it as a last resort, but please don't, um, or, or be very wary about using the not operator because it's, it's a bit of a wild card and it's, it's hard to um, really know how it's going to affect your results. And um, more likely than not, it's going to exclude relevant results more than it's going to um, exclude non-pertinent results. So be careful with that. And as an example here, I've got, uh, once again, another reference. It's not pertinent to what I'm doing research on. I look through the article and I realize, you know what? In the controlled vocabulary, there's this term weather forecasting. I'm not interested in weather forecasting. Um, I can probably tack on not weather forecasting and remove this article and other articles like it. The problem is that once again, uh, like I mentioned, sometimes these keywords can be used in context you don't exactly, um, you, you can't foretell. And here I've got an article that does look like it's pertinent to me. It's about forecast of icing events at a wind farm in Sweden. And it also has the keyword weather forecasting as part of its controlled vocabulary. So this would also be excluded had I used the not operator. So it's there. It's a tool in your toolbox, but be very careful about using the not operator and um, just, just be careful. The other thing you can do, and I'm going to go back to uh, Compendix once again, is that um, what you can do is you have all of your filter options over here on the left. So is it an open access? What type of document is it? Things like that. What you can also do is you can go down to the controlled vocabulary section, click on view more, and you're gonna have all these terms that pop up. When an article is indexed in Compendix or in Spec, 
the um, managers of these databases, they're going to associate certain keywords from a controlled vocabulary that they have themselves to each article. This helps give a little bit of structure to Compendix and uh, in spec so that certain articles will always have more or less the same keywords uh, associated with them. What you can do if you want to find more keywords that maybe you had forgotten about or that you hadn't uh, considered is take a look at these keywords, see what they are, and see if there's any other words that you might like to uh, incorporate into your uh, search strategy. For example, I've got here fighter aircraft. And you know, if I'm interested in aircraft and wings and the ice accretion on aircraft, what about the uh, ice accretion on jets or fighter jets? Um, so maybe jet or jets might be another word that I can put into my search strategy. At the same time, uh, maybe or maybe not, but I've got snow down here. If I'm looking at ice, maybe snow might be interesting. Just a, just some random uh, ideas, but it's worth your time to look at the controlled vocabulary and see if there's any other keywords you can incorporate into your search strategy um, or what domains most of your uh, search results are coming from. And if there is anything you can probably reasonably assume you can exclude. Okay, so we're going to go back one last time to uh, Compendix. Excuse me. And here's my final optimized search strategy. I've got truncations. I've got exhaustive vocabulary. I've got uh, exact expressions. I've added more keywords by going through my results. I've targeted certain field codes and everything else we just mentioned. So before optimization, I had 4,400 results. Then I dropped down by a third to 2,961 after incorporating all, or after using all of these um, database functionalities. And if I exclude all articles that mention airplanes and helicopters, I'm going to exclude another third of my results or even now half of my results and have only 1,455. How many articles do you need? Uh, that's a good question. Only you can really uh, decide how many articles you need for your thesis, your dissertation, or your research project. But at least they're all there. And we've uh, launched the net still very wide. I'm sure there's still going to be plenty of uh, results that are not completely pertinent amongst these 1,455 or these 2,900 results. But at least we can be relatively certain that we've been as exhaustive as we can related uh, relating uh, we've been as oh, excuse me we found as many articles as we can on the topic of numerical simulation of numerical simulation of ice accretion on airfoils and that we haven't excluded any articles that are pertinent which is the goal of the classical search method and once we've done this and we've optimized our search strategy, um, we've, we've gone to the last parts of the seven step process of the classical search method. And we now have some articles we can start to analyze and use in our search project, in our research project. And I've said this several times, but once more, keep in mind the classical search method is a very iterative process. It's so much back and forth. Even as a librarian, uh, as someone who does this most weeks and um, has to build complex search queries regularly, I still have a lot of trouble with it. And I always have to go back and forth between, you know, launching my search strategy, going back, modifying the concepts, adding in more keywords. Uh, some keywords aren't working for me, exclude them. How can I optimize it? How can I, what date is most pertinent for my research needs? things like that. It's so much back and forth. And um, one of the purposes of the classical search method is to be scientific with the way that you've uh, found your articles. So it is a bit of a science, but it's also very much an art. And you need to practice these skills in order to be able to be really good at finding information and finding uh, research articles and using specialized databases 
like Compendix and like uh, InSpec. So to resume everything I've just spoken about, um, why should you optimize a search strategy? Well, as I mentioned, because it's going to uh, give you more relevant results than the original strategy, you'll be able to find as many relevant articles as possible while excluding irrelevant articles, and you won't miss any useful or important information in your research domain. Depending on your search strategy, uh, the optimized strategy is either going to retrieve more or less results. Personally, I prefer starting off very wide and then working my way inwards by being able to exclude non-pertinent articles rather than having a, a very small initial basic strategy and then trying to build onto that. I find the second way is much harder than starting very broad and then working your way inwards. Just a little uh, suggestion. Sometimes it is good to start with 400,000 articles and you work your way down to 2,900 or 1,500 or whatever it was that we just got to. And then once again, to summarize how we can optimize a search strategy, we can assess the pertinence. Do we find articles we know? Are authors that we know about amongst our results? We can assess the keywords. We can add keywords. We can eliminate keywords. We can detect errors. If there's a bad separation of concepts, if we're uh, misusing truncations, if there are redundant keywords, um, fix that. And we can also always exploit database functionalities by using exact expressions, field codes, uh, controlled vocabulary. We can always also filter by language if we need as well. Um, and everything like that. Are there any questions related to the classical search method or um, uh, how to use Compendix or some of the optimization processes we just looked at? Because if not, uh, we're going to end early, but I've got one last section I want to show you that's really useful. We're using a different database now, so we're gonna get out of Compendix. And we're going to talk about how to search by citation, which is a much more uh, limited um, search strategy than the classical search method. What we're doing when we search by citation is we're taking a known article that we're interested in. And on the one hand, we're looking at which article, we're looking towards the past, and we're looking at which articles this article uh, cites. And then on the second hand, we're also going to be looking into the future and seeing how this article has been used since it was published. Have a lot of other articles cited it? Was it forgotten? Did it, uh, was it originally not cited very much? And then years later, there was a sudden uptick in interest in this research? Things like that. It can sometimes be very interesting and very useful for our research projects to, to uh, see how these articles have been used um, over time. So the way we're going to do that, or the tool we're going to use to do this search by citation is called Web of Science. Web of Science is another database um, it, that's offered by the company Clarivate which isn't a publisher, but they do uh, develop tools for researchers and librarians to analyze research. And there's different databases we can search in. We're going to be using the Web of Science Core Collection, which is their main collection for scientific articles. It indexes over 21,800 journals and 300,000 conferences. So the size is a little bit smaller than Compendix but it's still very large. And the main difference between Compendix or one of the main differences between Compendix and Web of Science is that Web of Science is, they, they index articles that aren't just related to engineering. You're also going to find a lot of articles from the social sciences, the arts and humanities, medical fields, things like that. So it's a much more generalist, multidisciplinary uh, database than Compendix which can be useful sometimes for some researchers for some contexts. So let's go take a look really quickly at the interface of Web of Science. 
So once again, I'm going to go to the library website, search tools, A to Z databases, and this time we'll go to W for Web of Science. Click on Web of Science, and we'll be sent here. Um, in a minute, we'll be sent to Web of Science. There we go. So I can pick what database I want to search in here. Web of Science is probably the only one you'll need to use. But just so you're aware of it, um, there's also the Derwent Innovations Index, which is used for um, a database for patents. There's the KCI, which is for research um, published in uh, Korea. Uh, CLO Citation Index, which is for uh, Spanish and Portuguese language articles and some other articles that deal with uh, articles relating uh, that deal with topics relating to Latin America and um, the Spanish speaking world. So that's also useful as well for some people, perhaps. But generally, we're only going to be looking at Web of Science. Um, for search by citation, since we're not doing a broad search strategy like with the classical method, we can stay in um, the quick search option. If ever we wanted to do an advanced search or complex query in Web of Science, we would click on advanced search. And then we have this box here again, like we had with Compendix. But for today, we're going to stay in quick search. And what we're going to do, just give me a moment, is we're going to search for an article. Um, and we're going to see, first of all, how the article has been cited over time. And also, what research this article cites. So I've got here an example of an article I found, a survey of models and algorithms for winter road maintenance. And it's by a polytechnic professor. And I'll choose what field code I want to look in. I could do topic, but I'll pick title because I know this is the title of the article I'm looking for. And I'll click search. And I've got four results. The reason I have four results is because uh, this article was a four part series. So I've got part one, part two, part three, and part four. And each one of these articles I can see have been cited a different number of times and have a different number of references as well. And this is one of those functionalities that's really fun with uh, Web of Science um, is they have a lot of analytical tools for research. Um, and I would also say that the um, interface of Web of Science is objectively nicer than Compendix. Not that Compendix is, doesn't look as good, just this one's a little bit more user-friendly than Compendix sometimes. So if I click on References, we'll take uh, part two as an example. If I click on References, I'm going to get the 35 references mentioned in this article here, and they're going to show up in the search results. So for some of the articles, they're indexed in Web of Science. So I've got all of the information relating to them. And this is going to be all of the articles and all of the um, documents that were cited in the initial article. So a survey of models and algorithms for winter road maintenance. These are all of the articles and documents that that article cites. For a lot of them, it's going to be not available. This is because um, they haven't been indexed in Web of Science, either because it's just not a journal that um, Web of Science index indexes, or sometimes it's going to be because um, it's not a journal article at all. For example, here I've got Snow and Ice Control Manual by McGraw-Hill Inc., which this is clearly a book. So it's not going to appear in Web of Science because Web of Science doesn't index books, it indexes articles. I've got a thesis as well. And I've got uh, also what looks like to be a report and other things. So one thing I can take a look at at which articles it's citing and get some information on these articles. The other thing I can do, and which might be more interesting to me uh, if I want to do some in-depth research into this article, is I can click on citations and I'll get a list of all of the articles that cite um, this article 
or that have cited this article since its publication. You're going to notice that the number of uh, results is slightly lower than what we saw here, which is 41. This is because Web of Science is excluding all self citations. So any articles amongst the four here uh, that cite part two are going to be excluded. So what this is basically telling us is that all three of these other articles, part one, part two, and part four, they cite part two, so they're excluded. And that's why we only have 38 results. And then I can look at them and I can see which articles have been uh, citing my initial research, who is doing it. And I can get, if I look over here on the left side, I can get more information on uh, who, which authors are citing this research. Is it a lot of self citations? Is it um, people who weren't part of the initial team? I can see what their affiliations are. So a lot of Université de Montréal and Polytechnique Montréal, which is, these are individuals who made up the original team. So that might not be so interesting to me either. And other information as well. So that's good. And the other thing that is really fun with um, Web of Science is I can get either a citation report. And what their citation report is going to tell me is amongst these results, so the four parts of this article, how many times have they been cited? In this case, it's 112. How many times have they been cited without self-citations? 108 times. And I'll get information on when this article was cited over time. So don't look at these bars here, look at this uh, blue line. And I can see that, okay, so it looks like the, the, the initial articles were published between 2006 and I think 2008. So it looks like for a period afterwards, there was a few citations, but not as much. And then in 2014, there was a spike, which decreased back to relative normal. And then another spike in 2017. And then it's become less published since that time. So then I can take a look at, okay, which articles cited it in these years? And why was there a spike in those years? And maybe explain it, if that's of interest to me. And I can get more information on the number of times each article was cited, um, depending on what year it was, uh, for, for each article individually, if I need as well. The other thing, which can sometimes, again, this isn't related to a search by citation, but is something I think you should all know about for Web of Science. We can also analyze the results. And we can get some information on what domains these articles amongst our results are from. Um, the Web of Science categories and some more information as well. Um, such as the publication year, who the authors are, affiliations, things like that. It's maybe not so pertinent for this, where all of the articles are written by the same authors, but for certain applications, certain research needs, it can be interesting to uh, have a tool where you can analyze the results in depth of um, which journals are publishing um, articles that conform to my research strategy or to my search strategy, and where are these authors coming from, things like that. Okay. So that's searching by citation, and this is a tool that you can use to search by citation. We're going to head back once again to my PowerPoint. We're nearly finished. Uh, we're almost at the weekend. Um, excuse me. And one thing I forgot is that if we click on the title of the reference, we'll get a page that's going to look like this. So again, we have the citations here. And if we click on citation, uh, create citation alert, just like with Compendix, anytime a new item um, cites this article, we can get uh, a notification. So again, if we wanna keep tabs on when maybe our own article is cited or an article that we know about that is very pertinent to our research, we can create a citation alert to get that information. And we can also view related records which are going to be um, records that uh, also have similar keywords 
and which have cited similar um, articles as this first article here. So that can be another way to discover some more research that is adjacent to the stuff that we're already studying. I hope all that makes sense. Um, so what can we use Web of Science for when we're looking up uh, cited references? Well, we can find references primarily from academic journals citing a specific author or article. We can find other authors and institutions which are working in your field by looking at um, who has cited your research over time. You have various analytical tools, whether the, the citation report or the analyzed results tools, and you can download that data in a CSV or an Excel format if ever you want to make your own visualizations. And Clarivate is really good at making different tutorials um, on how to use some of the higher functions. So you can also look at that very easily on YouTube and they have links to it on the Web of Science website as well. Any questions related to Web of Science or to uh, how to search by citation? Nothing, really? Okay. Um, if you do ever have any questions, feel absolutely free to send me a uh, an email if you need, or you can also always pass by the reference desk at the library, and we'll be very happy to help you uh, navigate some of the resources that are available here at Polytechnic to help you conduct your research. We have here also uh, a form, um, uh, or excuse me, a survey that we ask um, all the attendees of our workshops to complete if you can. This helps us to better understand your overall impression of the workshop, as well as how we can uh, modify the workshop to better tailor it to your needs because you know what your needs are much better than we do. And so we try to continually modify these workshops, especially the more basic general ones like the one today um, to conform to your needs. So if you can, please uh, either scan the QR code with your phone here on the screen right now, or I'll also add the, uh, I'll also add the link to the chat and you can fill all of that out and we can hopefully have some of your uh, feedback related to the um, workshop today. So there it is. If you ever need any help with um, anything, feel free to reach out to us. Um, the library is available either by phone by email, you can talk to us on our chat service. Um, and we're also accessible and you can also interact with us through Facebook, Twitter, and the BiblioPolyMTL uh, Instagram page as well. 